Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to the second of our, of our series uh, that is sponsored by the Friends of the University of New Haven Library. And uh, you never miss, do you? I missed the last one, unfortunately. <laughs> and trust me, I know what I miss because I like these lectures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice to see a familiar face. <laughs> well, anyway, we are really going to be uh, regaled by uh, Amy Thomas Thompson, who's going to tell me, tell us about something about which I know absolutely <laughs> nothing. So this is going to be real instruction. Of course, I'm probably too old to profit by it, but okay. Well, I will, you try. try. <laughs> this is about a failure to communicate historical rhetoric and diplomacy. In oh, I've got the wrong. It's like, wow, I, 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 I know something more than, more than what I think I know. <laughs> so I'm about to be really impressed with myself. <laughs> you just have to learn to live with your own inefficiency. <laughs> this is going to be... I can hardly read it. You know I don't know anything about this. Complexity <laughs> in technology and business and the demand for systems engineering. Right. I hand it over to you before I make another big boo-boo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I picked up the wrong one. So um, I think systems engineers, we live our life lives and do our work trying not to trying to avoid boo-boos <laughs> it's basically what we do <laughs> and the purpose of what we do <laughs> um, but I, I think I thought I would start with um, talking about system engineering because um, it has lots of connotations and a lot of people um, have a perception of what it is and, and I thought I would kind of tell you about some of the different perceptions uh, that we have about systems engineering and uh, why I feel personally, I mean this is my field, but why I think it's important and will be important at, at least for the next 10 or 20 years and probably even into the future. So I thought I would, uh, for everyone, I'm assuming that not everyone of course knows what systems engineering is, so I thought I'd talk about it and some of the big issues in system engineering which are uh, dealing with life cycle of products, uh, how we manage risk in projects, uh, talk a little bit about what it is we do, our actual method, our systems engineering method, and then talk about how this impacts different industries, and finally, uh, a little bit about our program of system engineering at UNH. Um, I thought I would <laughs> explain a little bit of my background, because maybe this will help us as we have some discussion about this, and to give you an idea of my own perspective. Um, basically, um, I had the opportunity while going to engineering school to work <laughs> and to work a lot. <laughs> and I had the opportunity to work in many different fields and in many different roles and it definitely contributed, contributes to my ability to be, I believe, a good systems engineer. Um, because I can see things from different perspectives of different engineers in my field and I'm very familiar with this whole life cycle at different stages. Um, so. Uh, I started my career in mechanical design. I worked for a company called Dynamo Corporation. We designed uh, pool tables and arcade games and uh, air hockey tables, foosball tables, and did some mechanical and structural design for them related to those cabinets and worked intimately in a wood mill, so I got very familiar with the processes for manufacturing wood products. Uh, I worked uh, in the chemical and industrial process packaging for four and a half years for Sandoz Agro, which merged which merged with Sibagagi to form Novartis um, for people who were from the pharmaceutical and ag industry. And I basically worked there to develop new uh, processes and packaging lines for personal care products and animal health products, a lot of liquids filling, ex uh, plastics extrusion, and became very familiar with those processes. I also worked in the medical device and pharmaceutical manufacturing process. I developed processes for them and also developed clean rooms and so became very familiar with uh, building construction, commissioning, the whole process of a, a little bit more from the civil engineering side of building and uh, installing rooms. 
uh, and facilities, and that was for North Safety Products. Uh, I also uh, managed a production or a maintenance production group, which was interesting, and I um, definitely uh, learned a lot about mechanics and that. And managing that group, I had uh, actually six maintenance personnel and three shifts mm -hmm. that I was responsible for managing. Uh, I also, uh, <laughs> during grad school, I got the opportunity to work on a software development project where uh, we actually had a project with the Navy to schedule um, for the Atlantic fleet of submarines to schedule their maintenance. And I did the math and algorithms for scheduling their maintenance. Um, and then finally, in my graduate research, I focused on supply chain design, integration of transportation networks uh, at the University of Rhode Island. And then I'll throw one other thing in there, which I did during my graduate studies, is I actually acted as a financial officer for a family-owned retail operation in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things I'll talk about is that what's interesting, I guess, about my experience is that I've been at the very beginning, the design, <laughs> I've been in trying to move that design into manufacturing. I've worked in manufacturing. <laughs> I've worked in transportation. I've worked in maintenance. And I've been involved with um, the financial aspects of, of companies. And so I definitely am a generalist <laughs> and have a, a broad aspect of how all these things fit together when you design complex systems. So, uh, so why start a system development process? What is this about? Um, basically, we start a new system when we identify there's a need. So um, the reason you start is because someone says, I need something that I don't currently have. And so, for instance, um, if, you're, if you're the military or you're a um, company like American Airlines, or you might say, oh, I need a plane, I, it goes a certain speed, and I need it to go 20 miles an hour faster. You know, how can I do that? That is a new need. I could say, that the efficiency of my, of my engine or my propulsion system uh, is no longer adequate and I need to increase the efficiency by 20%. And so that's a new need. This is something that I want to do. And that's basically what starts or drives a systems development project is this identification of a need. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how, what systems engineers do uh, to address that. The other thing that drives a new system to, be, to come about is an advancing technology. So there might, for instance, be, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that we're hearing about new technologies like, you know, advanced biofuels, nanotechnologies, new materials, all of these things. And so when a new technology comes out, we might say, can we incorporate that into our existing product? So I might start a system development project to say, how do, you know, these kind of extraneous technologies out there that have developed, how do I put that into my product? And so these are really the two things that drive, you know, starting a new system development project. The system development process, um, basically, this starts when this need is recognized and some feasible approach is identified. And um, uh, basically, this goes on until it's introduced into operational use, till we actually deliver the product to the customer. And that's the whole system development process from the time someone says, you know, I need a faster plane, <laughs> I need a more efficient engine to the time it's delivered to the customer. Systems engineers are involved in that whole, uh, often in that whole process. So it's an interesting <laughs> long process to be involved in uh, with lots of different aspects. Uh, there's usually to apply a system engineering method, there's got to be a reason for this because the system engineering method is basically a, it's a type of management tool. It's a quality tool. It's a lot of different. It's a risk management tool. And you're only going to spend the effort to do all of this if the system is complex or if there's high risks involved. Like there's reasons to spend the extra money to have a systems engineering role. And you're not going to do that, for instance, for if you're designing a toothbrush <laughs> or electric toothbrush, you probably you know, don't need a systems engineering role. It's not high risk. It's not, uh, you're probably not incorporating advanced technology. It's not a 10-year, 20-year development process <laughs> where there's lots of money involved that you have to have this additional overhead and cost with systems engineering. So you're going to see this in places where the, pr the product really is complex. If you're developing a, air, uh, 
an airplane or an automobile um, or a helicopter or a locomotive. You know, very, very complex systems that integrate lots of different disciplines. And uh, finally, it used to be the notion that there had to be an, an engineered system component um, to uh, require a systems engineer. And what I mean by this is that the traditional viewpoint of this is that it has to be an engineered system in order to need a systems engineer. And really what I think we're going to find in the next 10 or 20 years is that there's a lot of things in our world <laughs> they are getting more and more complex and they're not necessarily engineered products. <laughs> they're things like transportation networks, supply chains <laughs> that are global in size and have lots of complexity. And I think for all of us who are systems engineers and have to apply a technique to manage complex products, we all see the applications of our method to other systems that aren't engineered that are complex. And maybe I'm hoping that you'll begin to see that vision like I see it as I go through and describe this a little bit more. Uh, so, so why use a system development process? Um, well, you would do this again, going back to what I said, that there's this complex effort um, that it meets an important user need. So if, if I, even, I identify my need and it's something minor, and if the change is minor, then I probably don't need a systems engineering effort behind it. It's you know, a significant advance in technology that produces a higher risk, and then you would want to apply a systems engineering method to it. It requires several years to complete. So a lot of systems engineers work for companies where the development cycles on these products are anywhere between 7 and 20 years. Mm -hmm. Long time to develop new products. And you can see that you can't just kind of go about that process <laughs> in a willy-nilly kind of way. <laughs> like you need to have a pretty good method uh, to approach those kind of problems. Um, it's made up of interrelated tasks, many inter interrelated tasks. So if you're developing a complex system, you can have 50 or 100 or hundreds of people working on the development of a project. It has to be organized and integrated, or it's not going to happen on cost that, that you have budgeted or on schedule. Uh, it involves several different disciplines. So, you know, one of the things I find always is that I'm always, <laughs> I'm never working with all in, uh, systems engineers or all industrial engineers. I'm working with chemical engineers, electrical engineers, physicists, mathematicians, chemists, uh, maintenance people, <laughs> you know, just about every discipline you can think of, I have to interact with. And it helps if you can see things um, from their perspective and be able to explain things in a language that people who aren't in your field can understand. Um, it involves, uh, or it's a lot of times you're working, or this development is performed over with several different organizations. So, for instance, uh, if you're going to build, if NASA is going to build a space shuttle, um, you know, if you're not familiar with the defense industry, NASA doesn't build the space shuttle. <laughs> NASA is involved in aspects of it, but they subcontract out lots of that work to different companies, and somebody has to integrate the development across different companies. And what's interesting is a lot of times those companies are competitors of each other, <laughs> and so they have to cooperate, <laughs> and you know, the, you have this whole other dynamic of having to work with competing companies and collaborating companies to pull off this project. Um, and uh, basically, if there's a specific schedule and budget, and again, with all of these other things, it helps to have a systems engineering component to make sure that this whole project uh, comes off OK. So um, one of the things that, that's really important to realize about system engineering Another aspect of this is that um, there's a system life cycle to products. And uh, basically, again, we're involved from the, con the very moment that the concept is developed to the time that it's disposed of. So even 30 years later or 40 years later when this plane is taken out of service, we have to consider what's going to happen at the end of the use, if you can imagine that. So as an engineer, I have to design this product thinking about what's going to happen to this in 10, 20, or 30, or 40 years, and what's, what are the impacts of when it goes out of service, how am I going to take that into account when I design the product? Uh, so again, it starts at analysis or conceptual stage. We have a design, a development of a detailed design. We're involved in testing, and then ultimately, we also have to support 
production and operational use, which I'll get into a little bit more detail about really what that means and why that's so important. Uh, system lifecycle models, there's um, uh, basically three major types of models for system life cycles. There's the Department of Defense model, the international model, ISA model, and a National Society of Professional Engineers model. And they're all very similar. They've just kind of categorized different phases in different ways, but it's basically all the same process. And um, so life cycle considerations, I think uh, this is, um, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of, of system engineering. And it's, this is one of the real system engineering problems. And if you think about how uh, products have been designed traditionally as an engineer, um, basically a, a design engineer has to take into account how that product is going to perform when they deliver it to the customer. One has always been a very important aspect. I want to make sure it's going to go to speed, it's going to have the efficiency that I need it to have, it's going to do what it's supposed to do when the customer does it, and it meets those performance requirements. And so that's what really requires our technical backgrounds and our technical aspects are to make sure that we can do the engineering and science so that it performs the way it's supposed to. Um, but at the same time, traditionally, what we've always had to do is balance that with cost and schedule, right? Like I can't say I want to um, take an airplane from going 200 miles an hour to 300 miles an hour and not consider that that might cost $20 million or <laughs> even a lot more than that <laughs> to do that. And so really what design engineers have to do is have the system what we call trade-off analysis because you can't just keep going up and up in performance without impacting the cost and then ultimately the schedule when you can actually <laughs> finish the design of that product, have it built and deliver it to the customer. So what engineers have been struggling with um, really this whole, this whole decade, the last you know, 50 to 100 years is how do we deliver this uh, thing that performs properly at the cost and on schedule. And I'm sure you all can think of lots of things in the last 50 years that um, didn't go off without a hitch, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> and we, we can talk about some of those maybe. And then um, the, the other thing though that we've always considered also is reliability. And this idea of, um, you know, when I deliver a product to you, you are going to use it the first time, but then you're also going to use it over and over again for some life cycle. And we have to consider how reliable is this product going to, going to be? How many times are you going to be able to use it? How many times over some period of time? And so we've kind of always done reliability studies too. And so this is, you know, the traditional method is we kind of had to manage all of these different factors in the design process. So um, what has happened, some of these um, are issues that we have to consider. Some of them have, um, you know, come up 50 or 60 years ago, and some of these are very new considerations that haven't always been considered in the design of products. And these issues are, you know, is my product safe? Is it um, going to be, um, when I'm considering health and human impacts of either how it's used or its impact on people that come in contact with this product. Um, I have to consider human factors and usability. So if I'm designing an airplane or a helicopter, how is the pilot going to integrate with the system? You know, am I designing this so that it's easy to use? And you guys probably think about this all the time when you use computers or software programs or, you know, and if you've struggled with devices, if you've had an, you know, an iPhone or whatever you have and you're, you know, you get this thing and you're like, oh, this is <laughs> not easy to use. You know, as engineers, we have to think about, um, you know, we have to sometimes pay more. It might, we might have to add in a, a better technology so that it's easier for people to use. And this is definitely a factor we have to consider when we're designing. Uh, some of the other issues, in the 80s, this was really big that we began to start, we should begin to start considering um, how a product gets manufactured, assembled, and produced when we design a product. So believe it or not, for a long time, you know, when we made any product, we basically designed it just for performance and cost, and we didn't even think about whether the design was going to be easy to make on a production line. For a long time, engineers never considered that. And so when it got to production, a lot of times it was not, not designed well. And as industrial engineers, you know, that was a frustration for them because they would get a product and they would look at it and say, 
well, gee, you could have snap fit this instead of used eight screws. You know, so now you're on the production line and you're putting in eight screws and it could have been designed differently. And so in order to get this efficiency in production and manufacturing and to be able to deliver these products at a less expensive cost, there began this whole movement in the 80s of, uh, man it's called Design for Manufacture and Assembly. And this, so this is now another consideration that we have to consider in the design process. And some of the other issues there are maintainability. So for instance, um, let's say you purchase an automobile and let's say after three or four years your alternator goes out or your water pump goes out. So uh, what happens? And your, what happens to your automobile when one of those things goes out for a traditional design? Well, in, in my car, I had to <laughs> they had to take the whole engine out <laughs> to get to it. So, you know, these are the considerations that weren't always considered is how do I design this product so that it's easy and not expensive to maintain so that, you know, I can replace a $90 water pump without spending four hours to take everything out of its way to get to it. And so this is another design consideration. It's like, how do I design this so it's going to be easy to service? Um, another one that is definitely come up in the next, I would say the last 10 to 15 years is this idea of reconfigurability and modularity. And what that means is that, um, and you'll probably get an idea of why this is so important, this is really driven by the fact that technology is changing rapidly. Um, so let's take, for instance, your, your Boeing aircraft. And if that, the service life of that, or the, the time that it's in life before you take it out of service is, is 20 or 30 or 40 years, um, what do you think happens with that plane? Do you think the plane that you're on right now was the same plane that it was 20 years ago? You would hope not. <laughs> probably. You would probably hope that the computers running your Boeing aircraft that you get on this year is not the same computer system <laughs> from 20 years ago. So if you think about you know, these, these products that are complex and have these long life cycles, you have to be able to design these so that you can upgrade them. And it's even more important as technology changes because now you've got these systems that aren't completely changing in five or 10 years. You know, we've got technology that's changing every one, two or three years, especially when it comes to computing technology. So if you think about it, we have to take these complex systems and basically swap out new technology for the whole life of the product. And we have to design those products so that they're what we call reconfigurable or modular. And that if I need to completely complete, replace the computer system in my Boeing aircraft, because then a whole new one's come out, do I want to take apart my whole airplane? <laughs> and then there's lots of these airplanes, right? Do I want to take them all apart to take out the computer system? I want to be able to go in and say, you know, hip, computer system, up, out. <laughs> New computer system, and I test it, and it's off and running. But this is a completely different aspect of design. Like, it's not just designing it for the performance. You have to think about how you're configuring and all these the spatial configurations of how these are going together. And this is huge for um, things like airplanes, even like submarines for the Navy. They're trying to build these things so that they're modular. And they have huge, huge issues with this, that there's new technology coming out all the time. They want to be able to take you know, and their huge sub be able to take compartments out and put the new technology in. And so finally, um, a, f a couple of the few other things that we have to consider are when we design products, we have to think about now transportation and supply chain issues because when we decide and when we define and pick components that are going into our products, um, they're not necessarily coming from the U.S. anymore, <laughs> right? A lot of them are coming from overseas. They have to be, they're coming on ships, and these are large, large, a lot of times large components. And so now we have to also consider the fact that, you know, which components am I going to choose? Where are they going to be made? And does this affect the design and performance of my system? For a lot of systems, it does. Uh, disassembly, recycling, uh, end, of, end of life considerations. We now uh, have to consider. Um, let's say, for instance, because everyone is concerned about the impact of products and systems on the environment, we have to think now about what happens at the end of life of products. 
and are we designing these products so that they can be easily separated into materials and to different types of materials and reused and recycled and so if everyone wonders you know what this design for environment component is for engineers it's becoming more and more com important because again um, you know Boeing aircraft's a large thing but if you wanted to reuse the metals and plastics it's a lot of materials and if you could you would um, the way you design the product you would want to make it so that it's easy to disassemble and we're considering this also for consumer products I mean if you think about a lot of the things that you buy especially the electronics components uh, the life cycle for those products are only one two or three years and you're continually buying them and throwing them away and they're just landing in a landfill and so really you know the problems for engineers of and this next generation are going to be not only how do I design things for, for performance and cost, but I have to design it for all of these things. And the environment's going to become a big one <laughs> that we know about how to recycle and reuse these materials so that we can conserve basically our natural resources. Um, and then finally, um, the last really important aspect of system engineering is, you know, despite the fact that we have to consider now all these factors and we design something, um, the risk of the development project becomes really important. So if it's going to take you 10 or 20 years to develop a complex system, you have to be very careful about managing risk of that project because we've all heard of these big system failures where you know, you're five or 10 years in, you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars or even a billion dollars and you have nothing to show for it or the technology fails. Mm -hmm. and Systems engineer, our, one of our most important roles is managing risk and how that affects our design decisions in the process. So, and I have a nice graph of this in a minute, but these, uh, if everyone says why we need systems engineers, basically we exist because the design decisions are complicated. <laughs> and somebody has to say, you know, how are all these different systems coming together? What are the variables and how do they affect each other, their interactions and interfaces? And how do we design the system? So I basically can t set target levels or goals for all of these different factors. And then how do I make design decisions so that the decisions I make will come out with this product that does all of these things. <laughs> and that's what we want. Uh, so just some of the things we do, we have to do trade-off analysis. So it's no longer cost performance which is a pretty, a pretty mathematically and analytically simple problem to weigh two factors and make a decision. Now we have to deal with all of these factors. We do multi-attribute, multi-objective decision-making design with qualitative and quantitative factors. So to be honest, it's uh, making decisions with numbers is easy. <laughs> and for people who don't like math, you might think I'm crazy, but it's easy. What's hard is when you start weighing in things with numbers with things like how do you quantify reliability? How do you quantify impact on the environment? How do you quantify um, whether this is good for society? Um, <laughs> and, and weigh that with performance metrics. It's not an easy, uh, easy skill or easy problem. It's a more difficult one, actually. Uh, for engineered systems, this requires um, not only analysis of all these var variables and identifying the variables of all of these different systems and having them come in and try to make design decisions so that your products meet all of these goals. Uh, we're dealing with physical systems too and so it helps for systems engineers. We definitely do need to have some understanding of chemical systems, mechanical, electrical systems because these variables that come into our decision are based on these kind of higher order relationships based on physics and chemistry. So I <laughs> some really small text here for people in the back, but I can basically um, kind of describe this chart without having to read all the fine text. But basically for a systems development project, you're starting at the very beginning with a blank sheet of paper at the concept stage. You're starting at a very high level of risk because you have lots of unknowns <laughs> about how this project is going to proceed for the next whatever, seven, 10, or 20 years. So if you look at this graph, this is uh, basically the risk level is on the left-hand side. And the purpose of system engineering is that we're going to use methods that at each stage of the development process, we're lowering the risk of the project. That's the whole reason we exist, is that 
each stage we're supposed to be applying our methods and lowering the risk. And when I say risk, I mean the risk that the project is going to fail, that it's going to be over cost, that it's going to run too long, that it's going to deliver a product that the customer doesn't use or that the technology that we're trying to develop doesn't, can't, we can't even do, it fails. And th this is a very important role of system engineering. And we're applying, t basically what we do is at each stage we're applying techniques to lower, to try to lower that risk to our customers. Uh, the system engineering stages, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but this is basically what we do. Uh, we have a concept development phase where we analyze the needs, we explore concepts, and we define the concept. We go into the traditional kind of engineering development process where we apply these advanced new technologies and then we do detailed engineering design. And then finally we're involved in the production and operation and support. And the reason why systems engineers are, are involved in the production and operation support component is because of this idea that if a product is 30 years long and we deliver the product, we know that we're going to be upgrading that system. And it's going to require redesign on a continual basis. So it's not just designing for the time you deliver, but it's going to have to be re redesigned, especially if it has a long life cycle. So we're involved in that as well. And again, this doesn't translate very well, probably to you all, this is a little small print, but um, basically these are the, each of the steps of the system engineering process. And um, these are basically some of the tools we use. We uh, document um, a lot of the work in this phase. We, we create diagrams to try to visualize the system. And um, we create models and products through each phase. So these are the techniques that we're using to try to make better design decisions and lower the risk. And again, this is probably a little too small for you all, but this is um, the system engineering method. And basically what we do is we apply this method at every stage of the system engineering proje project and we iterate it over and over again. And basically this is a requirements analysis, uh, functional definition, physical definition, and then we validate. And the whole purpose for this is that, you know, if there's seven or eight stages of system engineering development, you should think of system engineering as basically a quality control method. That before you go to the next stage of development, you're sure that the work and the design that's been done so far, that the right decisions were made, and that you have lowered the risk going into the next phase. And that's the whole purpose of these methods. Even if you, you know, don't know or study what the, these methods are, that's the purpose of these. And <laughs> this, is, um, this is what I uh, show to my students in my system concept class. But that's basically that with all the details. And of course, I've added in all my notes where I think things are even more important um, to what they do. But this is what a systems engineer in a first concepts class would, would study and really try to understand what that process means and how to do that. Um, so again, this is the life cycle and it's applying those four steps to each phase of the life cycle. And it basically says what we're doing at each stage. So I thought I would um, get to some of the interesting applications of systems engineering and um, you know, why this is relevant to, to all of us, if we're, even for people who aren't, you know, engineers. Um, and why is there such a demand or why is there such, you know, I feel like there's hype about certain things right now like systems <laughs> and systems engineering and sustainability and, you know, all of these things are on the, the tip of everyone's, you know, tongue right now. And, but there's reasons for them and, and the reasons are there in our environment and in our world. <laughs> And there's things going on in phenomena that are driving this. And really what's driving this is the fact that in the defense industry, there continues to be <laughs> failures of major projects that are costing the taxpayer and the customers lots of money. And the reason for, there's some reasons for this. And I thought I would share, um, you know, this isn't just my belief. These are comments from actually the, the Deputy uh, Secretary of defense. And this was a recent report done just this summer, and he's basically explaining 
why uh, systems, he specifically systems engineering is going to be so important to the Department of Defense. And, um, you know, I, there's a few sentences here, but I thought I would kind of read them off to you because they're interesting. Um, basically, he says, too often we establish requirements um, that are at the far limit of the technological boundary. So basically, he's saying too often we're going for performance and not considering all of these other factors. And we're going at, you know, better, better, better performance no matter how much cost or how long it's going to take to develop those. And uh, basically, sometimes it can lead to uh, breakthrough developments that can uh, revolutionize warfare. Uh, but far more often, the result is disappointing initial performance, followed by cost and schedule overruns to correct uh, those performance failures. Uh, then we repeat the cycle several times before we eventually deliver the weapon systems years late, uh, millions or billions of dollars over budget, and uh, still uh, not at the performance levels that we originally sought. This is a huge problem in the defense industry. And they believe, they know that they need some methods to do this better than, than what they've been doing. So uh, trade-off analysis, basically, he says, uh, a related problem is our difficulty in making trade-offs between improved performance on one hand and cost and schedule parameters on the other. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> um, so uh, what is often an uh, admirable effort to get the best technology in the hands of our military personnel, we choose uh, to reach that one last performance improvement, uh, but the end result is this so-called requirement creep that we delay uh, getting any improved system to the military personnel and uh, we pay so much for the capability uh, to displace other important priorities from the budget. So it means that, you know, I can give you some examples, but things like body armor and these other problems that we've had, they were in development and they were so long in development they probably should have come out of development <laughs> before the end and gotten into the hands of the people who needed it. But we were, there were engineers and other people that were just pushing for performance. And somewhere, somebody has to say, look, <laughs> this is it, and it needs to go out. And these are the kind of decisions that need to be made in order to save, um, basically, money for the defense department. And uh, finally, the development cycle. Um, I won't go through all these details, but this, again, this is another interesting quote. And he's basically talking about the development cycle and how it's too long and it needs to be shortened. And really, one of the ways to do that is to apply systems engineering techniques. You can try to get the development cycle down from 20 or 10 years shortened. And that's something that we uh, try to teach systems engineers in class and through practice. And through experience, you can do this. Uh, risk in development, again, this is huge uh, to reduce technical risk. Uh, our standard practices will be uh, to conduct a preliminary design review uh, before milestone B. So they're actually laying out what's going to be done to reduce risk. And these are almost exactly the systems engineering process. And I thought I would highlight this because this is where you know, I, I, I said I was going to tell you, you know, what the demand for systems engineers and what's driving this and where it's from. Um, basically, I would, this is kind of interesting. I would like to start with our most important resource people. In order for the acquisition system to function effectively, it must be supported by an appropriately sized cadre of acquisition professionals with the right skills uh, advancing to, su to successfully perform their jobs. Um, well, they need the right skills and training to, to successfully perform their jobs, however, uh, vacancies and key acquisition management positions, um, and over uh, reliance on contractor personnel and the ability uh, to utilize uh, the specific competencies of our government employees affect all contribute to the situation that we're in today. Basically, this summer, what the, this person has said is um, the Deputy Secretary of Defense to address these personnel deficiencies, we will increase the number of acquisition personnel to 20,000 positions from 2010 to 2015. Uh, future years defense program. Uh, this will include over 9,000 contracting, estimating, pricing, as well as uh, contract oversight positions at the defense 
contract uh, audit agency and the defense contract management agency, uh, which will help ensure that DOD knows what it's buying and what it's paying for. And so basically, one of the biggest drivers of the need for the systems engineering is going to be the defense. And um, you know, a lot of people think that um, well, all these systems engineers are going to go to the private companies, to places like um, Hamilton Sunstrand and Sikorsky and Pratt & Whitney. And, um, but really, a lot of these systems engineers are going to work for the government. And if you think about this whole transaction, it requires systems engineers on the customer side, but it also requires systems engineers on the government side so that they're buying and managing their, uh, their consultants. So if you, or their contractors, if you actually go to the job sites, there's hundreds of positions right now for requirements of general and systems engineers at the entry level. And those salaries range from like 40 up to 117,000, even some of the ones I saw today. A lot of them have that whole range, and they depend upon where you're at in, in your, um, how many years of experience you have. But there are entry level positions out there. There's a lot of them, and there's going to be more. And this talks a little bit about um, the remaining 11,000 new hires will come from uh, conversion of contractor positions to federal civilian positions. Uh, these positions will primarily be program management, systems engineering, logistics management, and business management positions. So these are the positions that they're going to be um, hiring at the Department of Defense. And so finally, you know, there's a whole other world out there, right? <laughs> besides the Department of Defense. And basically, systems engineers go to work any place where there's complex products, the automobile industry, and transportation equipment, and biomedical. These are fields that are growing. Um, we could talk about all the reasons why they're growing. And some of the, um, you know, the, the auto industry, just to give an example of a development problem in the auto industry, um, there's, you can point at lots of indicators why the auto industry has not performed well and had to, a lot of the companies had to be bailed out. But just to give you an example, um, over a 10-year period, and I'm going to say maybe about 1995 to 2005, just to give you an example, um, let's take, for instance, the Ford Taurus, which everyone is kind of familiar with that car. Has everyone seen a Ford Taurus? And how, much, how many changes have you seen in the Ford Taurus over the last 10 years? Any ideas? It, it pretty much looked exactly the same. I don't know if you guys remember this, or you have, if you're not a car buff, <laughs> you may not notice these things. But if you looked at the Ford Taurus body style and almost everything in it for about 10 years, exactly the same product. If you take a similar product, like the Toyota Camry, they had basically eight major revisions in the same time to that design, uh, while you know a similar competing model in that same class did not change. So some of the major issues in the auto industry, and it has lots, one of them is it never has really found a good way to um, develop new products or to incorporate new technologies in an efficient way. And it's definitely one of the factors that's led to the demise of, I shouldn't say demise, <laughs> but um, to the problems of the auto industry. And systems engineering, those methods, just like they help or should help in other industries, could help in the auto industry. And I think that you'll see if our auto industry kind of reorganizes and manages to get itself together, my feeling is that they'll probably would want some more systems engineers uh, at their companies. And uh, there's reasons why in these other industries as well. As well, and finally, I'll kind of say um, you know, we talked about systems engineering and the product development process, uh, but there's definitely there's tools that we have that can be applied to developing complex systems, uh, supply chains, transportation networks, healthcare delivery systems, service systems, multinational corporations. All of these things are increasing; they're increasing in complexity, and my belief is that even though we focus on applying systems engineering to advance products, the same skills that we have that we apply to products can be applied to these um, types of work systems that are complex. And I think that you'll see more systems engineering, 
systems engineers working in those areas as well. And obviously the government agencies, I think systems engineers will have a future. And um, just finally, the system engineering at UNH, we have a unique program here. And it's one of the few undergraduate programs in system engineering. And the other thing that's unique about it is it's actually, um, you know, from my perspective, it's a combined program of systems engineering and industrial engineering. And there's benefits of that. And especially if you think about that the design aspects now for products, you need to understand the life cycle of the product. You need to understand production and manufacturing, maintenance, uh, distribution channels, transportation, uh, designing for the environment. You have to consider all of these things. And so systems engineers, if you have some industrial engineering knowledge and those traditional industrial principles, and then also um, basically how to organize and, and measure and track work, um, you know, there's not that, I shouldn't say there's not that much difference between work on a production line <laughs> and design work. There is a difference. But the methods, again, can translate from one to the other. And so there's a, there's a lot of skills in industrial engineering that are helpful to systems engineers in their work. Um, and so this is from NCOS. This is the International Council on Systems Engineering. This is their model. And it, basically, the systems engineer role is supposed to be one of working side by side with our other disciplines. And we all have our, uh, um, basically, areas of expertise. Ours is how to apply the systems method or the systems engineering model. We're working side by side with other engineers to, during the development process to develop pro a product um, that meets the customer's needs. And then finally, our program here. Um, these are basically the things that we teach in our courses in systems and industrial engineering here in order that we're providing our graduates with the skills that they need to do this job. And you can see some of the major ones there are uh, sister, uh, system operations, complex systems modeling, uh, and uh, systems cost and scheduling, very important. System performance, uh, system testing, and w basically we uh, hopefully have a curriculum that covers all of this. And again, I'll kind of end with the fact that um, you know, really if with systems engineering, you're meant to go work and to develop complex products, but there is room for you to go into a lot of other industries if you are suited or interested in that area. And I <laughs> thought I'd throw this in here <laughs> as one of the last slides because I've um, been really involved here for the last year in the sustainability effort on campus. And people ask me, you know, you're a systems engineer, you know, what do you know about <laughs> the environment or designing for the environment or environmental sustainability? And I have a little bit of a unique perspective on this. One is that I actually did um, study with some of the experts who came up, came up with the methods for designing for manufacturing environment. I actually used a lot of the beta testing software that's out there now. So I do have um, a, a background in how to design products for the environment. But I think an even more interesting question is, um, you know, the way I view this environmental sustainability basically requires thoughtful use of technologies, products, supply chains, reverse supply chains, and processes. Like all of these are going to determine how environmentally sustainable we are. And I, I guess what I would ask everyone to think about is that, you know, the, the people that determine the way our world is and the technology we are using, um, whether we like it or not, are engineers. <laughs> like we, we determine what materials are being used, the processes, how they're being made, if we're transferring these products all over the world or not, or if we're getting them locally. Um, it, ultimately, they're supposed to be customer driven. <laughs> that's supposed to drive that, but engineers determine a lot of that. And so the role of engineering and, and creating an environmentally sustainable world is going to be really important. And it's going to be really important for us to work with scientists, with economists, with uh, policymakers, all of these different disciplines to help create this world that we all think that we can probably do a little bit better than what we're doing right now. And um, so the sustainability problem, um, it's basically, you know, when I look at the sustainability problem, you know, you have to take for granted I'm a systems engineer, but this is how I look at it. It's defining complex socioeconomic, socioeconomic goals and requirements, determining the functions that are gonna support those goals, 
configuring a structure to deliver these functions and design a working system. So, you know, we're going to have to design recycling networks. We're going to have to do a lot of different things that are going to involve engineering and design and um, finally validate if it'll work before we implement it. And so uh, I see, you know, one of the ways I see sustainability is from a systems perspective. And can you apply a systems methodology to improving some of the systems that we have out there uh, to try to have a better impact on the environment? And, and finally, these, some of the notes from systems engineering are from the textbook that I use in my course, and then I took some material from the International Council of Systems. And I have to apologize because I wasn't really tracking time. <laughs> and I'm in a, a time-free zone, I guess, with no clocks on the wall. But um, that's basically what I, what I, my presentation. And I would be happy to discuss anything that comes, came to your mind. <laughs> um, so do, do you all have any questions for me? Yes, I do. OK. <laughs> if a young student uh, uh, found this interesting, what basic courses would he or she have to take uh, to have a foundation to, to start this study? Well, the, at our school, the system engineering program, the first two years are you take the same courses that any other engineering discipline takes, and then we specialize the last two years on systems, the, the concepts. Um, so that's, that's what the requirements would be for here. And that's, that's typical of most any engineering program it's pretty structured. We all take the same things the first two years and specialize in the, ne in the second two years. Yes, so you had a question. Yeah, um, do you have to have courses like psychology or business principles involved? I mean, since it's it's found to be that like the business principles are involved, I mean, since it's found to be like a lot of what you have to do is get people to work together. <laughs> yes, I think so too. Do you have that skill set? Um, we do. I mean, I was fortunate enough to take an organizational behavior class. Um, I actually took design of experiments in the psychology department, so I definitely, with the systems and industrial engineering background, um, we, have to, we do have to take more um, classes, uh, study more things about how to incorporate people into systems. There's also a traditional course called Human Factors that's taught in industrial and systems engineering, and that's basically the science and technology and psychology of how to incorporate people into systems. And then there's some, I actually, one of my colleagues who I studied with, uh, with my PhD, he went to the MIT Age Lab. And what he does now is he is basically designing cars for BMW. Um, he's looking at how people interact with the dash and technology in the car. Mm -hmm. And he's doing experiments to try to improve. And specifically at the Age Lab, they're looking at how elderly people interact with their vehicle and trying to make vehicles that are more friendly. <laughs> um, and th th what's interesting, of course, those improvements that help elderly also help the rest of us in a lot of cases. Um, so basically, he's helping to make, and that was a little bit of an area of his expertise, was how to incorporate and integrate people with systems. Do you guys have some other questions? It says everyone know what systems engineering is now? Did I give you, did I give you the, the hour cram pack lecture? <laughs> Yeah. yeah I, I appreciate both of the uh, earlier questions, the question, and I guess this is related to it. Um, I assume that there comes a time when you're not going to know the underlying engineering. I would think that if you're working for Boeing or whatever, get aeronautical engineers, mechanics, electrical, all involved. I don't, I don't know if the system engineers come in some kind of a hierarchy and you have one super system engineer. <laughs> So depending on the industry uh, they, d and the company, they approach this differently, how they integrate systems engineering with their, the rest of their engineering process. Um, you know, s some companies choose to, when you're a system engineer, they choose to start you just like everybody else at a design phase. And so you have to go work you know, a year or two in design just so that you learn the product that it is that you're working on. And then you move into a systems engineering role. 
some are really strict where you have to go do something, you have to go work in an apartment for 10 years before you can be a system engineer, or before they'll let you. That's like what I could call a worst case. <laughs> because um, you know, you've got someone with all these skills and if you're keeping them in a really technical design role where they're sitting there maybe designing a gear all day long and you're not using their you know, knowledge of the systems, it's probably not a real good thing. But you definitely have to, really what happens when you come out as an engineer is you can work in a lot of different fields. You know, you could go work for pharmaceuticals or biomed products or, you know, go work and build for Boeing. And it's, it's pretty much a given that you're going to have a lot to learn to, about that product uh, wherever it is you go. And so for engineers, you know, we, we have ABET, our accreditation board requires us to have to instill this idea of lifelong learning. <laughs> and engineers are definitely lifelong learners because even though you know the basic engineering principles and you come out with a skill set, depending on where you go to work, you're going to have to learn that product. You know, just because someone understands you know, how an engine works doesn't mean that's going to translate when they, they went to a biomed company and had to develop biomed products. Um, so you know, it, it, one of the things I can definitely tell you, if you look at my background, I definitely had to pick up books and learn things. You know, I wasn't a mechanical engineer, and I had to pick up books and understand machine design where, and, you know, depending on whatever your job is, you ha do have to learn the aspects of that product, and that's part of, I think, what engineers, we, we know. We, we know that we have to go and, and learn that product. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your question no. or not. Yeah. But I think there was another part of your question that maybe you didn't address, ahead. and that is, we don't always know precisely all the information we would like to know to move from part A to part B. Mm -hmm. We all live in a fuzzy world where you get partial information. And yet, you know, you guys, engineers, that's when the rubber hits the road. You've got to at some point make a decision, mm -hmm. uh, move, the, uh, move along, and you don't have all the information mm -hmm. you'd like. Uh, and, you know, again, I think one of the things that's fascinating about systems is there's always feedback. There's always something coming back to you that sort of tweaks how you make decisions, but that makes it very hard to get to the bottom line. <laughs> so, you know, this goes back to this I, I concept of managing risk and the unknowns. There's, in a complex system, there's so many unknowns, and you mm -hmm. try to, during the systems process, to figure out what those are and lower your risk. And you can't, you know, as a systems engineer, you can't know every little detail about a gear or uh, a control system or you know, you have to say these are the major variables, these are the important variables that we think that's going to affect cost, performance, and risk. And you track those and you become familiar with those really important ones. And there's some that you can kind of ignore because either through history or your knowledge, you realize that, that these are least likely to cause the really serious problems in your project. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard decision to make to say which things are we going to track and which things are noise, <laughs> noise variables that we're going to ignore. But it's it's a complex. That's that's the nature of designing complex systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Farbrother. Uh, yeah, I've Sorry, got a I got question it wrong. That, that relates to what Pauline's just said and, and to Roger's and to what the was it the Under Secretary of State said, and that's this issue of, of risk and the fact that it's it uh, you've got a certain body of knowledge as you go through this project as and it's changing all the time, and new technologies come along which are going to put a, an inflection in that risk curve. As you l try and lower the risk, risk, a new technology comes along and you think, oh, that would be great if we could incorporate that. So aren't you there sort of inverting the risk curve? And you, it's going in the other direction while you consider that. So what mm -hmm. tools are, are, are available to the system engineer that, that help uh, reduce that risk again. How do you do the, the assessment of that new technology when it comes along partway through a project? So, you know, and this is something I teach even in my systems class to my sophomore engineers is we talk about the ways to mitigate risk and there's lots of ways to do that and we, we talk about these different approaches to how to bring the risk down. So if you're going to try to introduce a really high-tech or ad advanced technology that hasn't been proven, then you have to figure out how to incorporate that and not have that big jump in risk. And the way you do that is really to do testing. You know, it's like, it's, if it's unknown, it's really unknown. The way you mitigate the risk is that you have to determine how, mu how much you're going to test 
and begin to figure out what those knowns or unknowns are to reduce the risk. There's other techniques like um, you could decide to develop an, another technology in tandem or in parallel. So if you think about it, even though you choose this advanced risk, you could say, well, we're also going to develop this other thing, so if this one falls through, <laughs> we've got a backup. You know, just like any other ways that we mit mitigate risk, there's techniques for this. One is if you want that advanced technology, you have to be prepared to do a lot of testing and quickly in a systematic way so that you, those unknowns become knowns. And then there's other strategies like kind of backup types of strategies where you have something to fall back on and you're not just at the end of the project with, with zero and nothing to show for it, if that, if that makes sense. And we talk about those in systems engineering and how to... a moving target. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's the, why the cost of Right, but I think that, you know, part of, I think, what the, was the Assistant Secretary of Defense? Um, but I think what he was saying is that somebody needs to be thinking about risk and cost, and someone has to decide whether to take on that new technology or not. And someone has to know the customer, the cost, the schedule, understand the risk involved in that advanced technology, and make better decisions than what has been made, because nobody's happy with a lot of the decisions that have been made from the taxpayer point of view, from the government, from the military's perspective, they're not real happy either. And the fact that they feel like they were denied a lot of these technologies because they were stuck in the development process. Right. So <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very much <laughs> for coming. And I hope for everyone who's not the engineer that this was still interesting for you and it was still relevant to, um, that you can see how this applies. Thank you so, for this, this was entirely <laughs> Yeah.